everyone. Welcome to Pint of Science 2021. We have two very exciting talks for you this evening. Uh, tonight is titled, There is no Planet B. Uh, Pint of Science runs every single year in May all across the world. Uh, we aim to bring scientists into accessible venues to communicate their work to the public. So before we start, there is a chance to win some Pint of Science merch. So all you have to do is fill out the feedback form that is linked below in the description. Uh, the competition ends at the closes at the end of June. So first off, we have a talk from Greg Much, who is going to talk to us about his important work on climate change solutions. And um, thank you very much to Pint of Science for the opportunity to talk with you all this evening. Um, it's a shame that we can't be in the pub, but um, YouTube will have to do for now. So as was mentioned, my name is Greg Much. I'm a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow at Newcastle University. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, technologies that have been called negative emissions technologies, direct air capture, carbon dioxide capture, CO2 removal, but generally the idea of removing CO2 directly from the air. So just a very quick disclaimer, although I work for Newcastle and I'm funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering, the views here are my own. This is what I would say if you asked me in a pub, what do you do? So the aim of what I want to get across this evening is the sense of scale of the issue of climate change and particularly carbon dioxide emissions and also the urgency in doing something about it. So if you remember any words through this, just remember scale and urgency. So some really simple points to kick us off. The world's population has grown a lot and it's still growing. So if we look at this, uh, our world and data slide, looking at the world population from if we pick roughly the, industri the start of the Industrial Revolution until, um, until now, we, we see roughly an order of magnitude increase in the number of people on planet Earth. So it's projected that this will still um, continue to rise up until around 2100, where we see it peaking roughly about 10 billion. So we go from approximately 1 billion to 10 billion people on planet Earth in a relatively short space of time. And the, the fact that brings this all into context really is that 5% of all human beings that have ever lived are alive right now. So at the same time, we're still predominantly a fossil fuel society. Um, this is the sort of second simple point that I want to, you want to start with. So the numbers on this slide are not important. Uh, the, the timeline along the bottom is. Again, if we start around the Industrial Revolution, we see that we start to use coal in increasing quantities. We then discover oil, and then as a result of bringing up oil, we also discover gas. And if you think of that last slide where we saw the increasing world population on this sort of time scale, it starts to make sense why we see this increasing use of fossil fuels. There's more people on Earth and we need energy. So the question at this point I would normally quite reasonably get is, what about renewable energy sources? I've just talked about coal, oil and gas at this point. So. If we look at energy consumption by source around the world and just go all the way to the right, because as, as you see along the timeline on the bottom, it doesn't change all that much. If you go all the way to the right and look at 2019 and start going up the right hand side, you see oil, coal and gas making up more than 80 percent of the energy that we consume. And then you see the smaller bits of nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, biofuels and other renewables. So they are there. Um, about 10 to 15% of the energy we consume is produced via renewables. But I think it's quite important to point this out. This is the world over the, over the whole world. And in the UK, we hear a lot about wind energy, for example. And on individual days, weeks and months in the UK, we see significantly more than 10 or 15% of our energy in the UK being produced by renewables. But this isn't the case around the world. We're still more than 80% powered by fossil fuels. The third simple point I'd like to make to start with is fossil fuel use drives carbon dioxide emissions and therefore climate change. And I'm not going to talk in length about climate change science. I'm just going to start with a simple premise that if you take something like coal, which is made of carbon, you burn it in air, which contains oxygen, you end up producing CO2 and CO2 drives climate change. And I can talk more about that in the questions at the end if we want. But these CO2 emissions come from a variety of sources. So we see here that we've got electricity and heat production. This is basically gas, for example, being burned and then to produce electricity that arrives into your home through the grid. We've got transport and we would commonly think of cars, for example, but we have to remember things like aviation and shipping. Shipping 
moves lots of commodities all around the world, day and night, and it accounts for a large portion of CO2 emissions. We then have industries like manufacturing and construction, and the large, largest portion of this is basically cement and steel manufacture. And now this isn't the energy that goes into these processes to make cement and steel. This is actually the formation of the cement and the steel. So in cement, for example, we take rocks and we heat them up to produce cement. When we do that, we release CO2. So there's the energy going in and there's also the chemistry of the process. And then we have some other sectors. But the point is that these CO2 emissions come from things that we take, um, take for granted. We do, we do them every day and they're kind of core to the way we live our lives. And this has resulted quite clearly in a massive increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So for a few thousand years, we've got a relatively low concentration. And then again, roughly around the start of the industrial revolution, we see this massive increase in CO2 concentration. Now there's two data sets on this slide. So the blue line is taken from ice core data. So you drill down into ice and you can quantify how much carbon dioxide was in the air by basically what was frozen into that ice at the time. And then there's the orange line, which is directly measuring CO2 concentration in the air. And you can see that, that those data sets, the blue and the orange lines overlap, giving us good confidence that this data is, is real and correct. And you can see in the, the color map of the globe that the warming is not the same everywhere. It's different in different regions. So the purple are the regions that are warmed the most. And there are actually a couple of regions that have cooled down. But on average, the world has already warmed by approximately one degrees or so. So this is the most complex slide that I'm going to show. I'm going to try and explain it um, in a sort of simple terms. But the important thing is just to look at the x-axis on the bottom, so years of current emissions. And then if you look down the left-hand side, all these different names, these are different groups and teams of people that have tried to work out how much more CO2 can we release into the atmosphere to have a two-thirds chance of staying below 1.5 degrees warming. So that's what the, the line across the top says, a 66% chance of less than 1.5 degree warming. So they're trying to work out if we just continue as normal, how much more years can we continue to do that and have a good chance of staying at less than 1.5. So you'll see, hopefully you can see my cursor, you'll see that the data is scattered over a wide um, sort of variety or range of years. There's also some of this data that has very large uncertainty on it. And it's a very complex thing to model, right? You're trying to model the Earth's climate system. So what I take from this slide is that some people already believe that we've emitted too much CO2 to stay below or have a 66% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees warming. But roughly, they all sort of congregate around this kind of five to 10 years of current emissions before we guarantee that there's a fairly good chance of going beyond 1.5 degrees global warming. And bear in mind at this point that the Paris Agreement, for example, stipulates that we should try and stay below two degrees of warming before we have catastrophic effects due to climate change. So at this point, if we know that CO2 is the biggest driver of climate change, what, what can we do about it? What can we do with CO2 instead? So I'm going to set the simple premise that we basically have two options. We either avoid CO2 entirely, so we just move to a situation where we just use renewable energy, for example, to power everything. And this scenario would be called gross zero. We no longer emit CO2. The second option, or the second scenario, is that we still continue to release some CO2, but we do something with it rather than letting it go into the air. We either store it or we reuse it. And this situation, which you'll hear lots on the news, et cetera, is called net zero. And it's because we still emit CO2, but we don't let it go in the atmosphere. So overall, it's net zero. And this can be sort of easily envisaged as a bathtub. So if we think of the bathtub as the global climate, and we know that if we keep pouring CO2 into that bathtub, eventually it's going to overflow and that would represent sort of disastrous effects on the climate. So we've got two options. We either turn off the tap, which is the gross zero situation, or we continue to allow something to come out of the tap, but we know we have to pull the plug so that we start to balance things. And this is the concept of net zero. So if we think about the first scenario, gross zero, what does that actually look like in reality? What would, what would society look like? So it means 100% renewable energy, which, bear in mind, I just said that the world currently is on the order of 10, 15% renewable energy and about 80, 85% fossil fuels. So that's a large change. We would no longer be able to have commodities like cement, steel and plastic. As I explained, it's not only the energy that goes into making these things, it's the emissions that come out of the raw materials when you transfer, transform them into things like cement and steel. 
So this is a wholesale change to society. We use vast quantities of things like cement for building, and we're very used to just plugging our phones into the wall, etc., to be able to charge them. And the kicker, if you like, with this is that if you believe some of that climate modeling that says we've got you know five to 10 years or so, if we want to stay less than 1.5 degrees warming, we've got to do all that, but not only do all that, do it in the next 10 years. And that's obviously massive. So at this point, for the purpose of this talk anyway, and again, happy to take questions on this, I'm gonna rule out avoiding CO2 entirely, at least on the time scale that's relevant for avoiding 1.5 or two degrees global warming. So that leaves us with capturing CO2, storing it or reusing it. And I'll talk briefly about reusing CO2 to start with. But just bear in mind what we're talking about here is that we still emit some CO2, um, but we, we do something to remove it so that it doesn't lead to this sort of tipping point in terms of the climate. So this scenario, what does this look like? I'm not arguing that we forget about renewables. We still definitely focus on developing as much renewables as possible but we sort of acknowledge that CO2 is going to be produced in certain processes and we need to do something with it. We either capture it or we um, store it in some way. So as I said, there's two options, reusing and storing. And if we take reuse to start with, we've got two options. We either directly use CO2, so this green sort of pathway at the bottom, and we can make carbonated beverages, for example, or we can do processes called enhanced oil recovery, but these processes don't actually lock away CO2. They result in, for example, a carbonated drink or bringing up more oil. So the alternative is that we try and chemically or biologically transform carbon dioxide into something else. So as you can see on the slide, we can make synthetic fuels, we can make polymers, plastics, organic chemistry means making solvents, or we can make minerals. And the problem, again, with a lot of these things is fuels and urban solvents quite often will end up turning into CO2 again when we burn them. Plastic's not great for the ocean. But one of the major simple sort of arguments for this is if we turn all the CO2 that we currently put into the atmosphere into these products, we'll have too much of them. They'll be worthless because we emit vast, vast quantities of CO2. And the way, the easy way to sort of quantify this and think about it is that this Royal Society report found that currently we use less than half a percent of the CO2 that we produce annually in any process like this. And in the future, it's likely to be less than 5%. So again, I'm just sort of going through and ruling things out. I'm, I'm going to rule out reusing CO2 for getting us to below 1.5 or two degrees because it's unlikely it'll ever be, well, it will be able to produce something at the scale required. We produce billions of tons of CO2 and we'd have to produce products from it and they would essentially become worthless because we would need to make so much of them. So we're left with this idea of storing CO2. And this is a process called carbon capture and storage. The idea here is that you separate carbon dioxide, you concentrate it and then you pump it offshore and you pump it underground into something like a depleted oil and gas reservoir. And we're confident that this is a good idea because we know that oil and gas reservoirs have stored oil and gas for thousands, if not millions of years. And they've done so securely until we came along and popped them open and took the oil out. So we're fairly confident that if we pump fluids on back underground, as in carbon dioxide, it can be stored there for thousands or millions of years also. And in terms of the space or the volume that we've got available to do this, currently we emit approximately 40 billion tons of CO2 every year. And we know that these reservoirs and aquifers, etc., have orders of magnitude more capacity to store CO2 than we require. So we could do this for hundreds or thousands of years to get us to that point where we can be 100% renewable. And these images kind of show you how this works. So in the left-hand image, you basically do the reverse of taking oil out of a reservoir. You pump carbon dioxide back into it. And the image on the right talks about the different trapping mechanisms, similar to how oil is trapped in these reservoirs. To start with, you have something called structural trapping. It's just the structure of this geological formation. And as you progress through time, you see in the bottom right, you've got mineral trapping. And what that means is that the CO2 is actually mineralized and turned into a stone underground. So a very secure way of storing what would have otherwise gone into the earth. And this is actually done. This is done currently. So this map shows a variety of different sites around the world where carbon capture and storage is being performed. So to be clear, the dots that are colored green are sites 
actually in operation. So CO2 is being captured and pumped underground. All the other colors on the slide are sites that are either in late stages of development, they're, being, they're under construction or they're planned, etc. But the point I would make here is that if our ambition is to make sure we limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees, if you look at the scale on the left-hand side down here, we're talking about megatons per annum. So far, I've been talking about emissions on the scale of gigatons per annum. So that's three orders of magnitude different. We're doing this at a scale of three orders of magnitude too small in terms of the emissions that we produce every year. And the point I want to make with this talk is simply capturing the CO2 is not really enough. This only slows the amount that we release into the air. So again, a little bit of a complex slide, but I'll try and talk through it. If we just continue as business as usual, we don't do anything, we just carry on. We see that our energy use peaks at some point in the future, similar to how um, the population is, is predicted to peak in the future, like I talked about in one of the first slides. However, if we want to stay below two degrees, we need to follow this pathway. So this means that we get rid of the bulk of the CO2 we would have emitted using these conventional abatement technologies. So replacing coal, oil and gas with things like wind turbines, solar panels, nuclear power, and then putting this carbon capture and storage on any facilities that we have left. But we still know that we'll have this gap and, it's, and to get to below two degrees, we'll actually have to go negative. So what that means is that to account for the processes that will produce CO2, so for example, a plane flying or something like this, a dispersed small source, we actually need to suck CO2 directly out of the air to keep us below two degrees. And this is the concept of a negative emissions technology. So there's lots of different negative emissions technologies, and I'm just really gonna quickly going to compare two of them. There's 10 on this slide, but I'm gonna compare and contrast two. So I'll start with number six, afforestation and reforestation. This is just a fancy way of saying plant more trees. So this is a cheap and mature technology, if you can even call it a technology. Um, but the issue here is that if we want to do this seriously to mitigate climate change, we need approximately 10% of the Earth's surface, and that's roughly the size of the US and China combined, to deal with only 20 years or so of current emissions. So cover 10% of the Earth in trees today, and you can start over the next 50 years as they grow, that will deal with 20 years of emissions. So it's a common question I get in these talks, why don't you just plant more trees? Well, the argument is it's not really going to make up for things of the skill required. The opposite technology is something called direct air capture. This is completely opposite. It's very new, it's very expensive, um, and it's got almost like the opposite demand. It would require so much energy to do this. Um, there was a paper recently which showed that if you want to rely on this technology only by 2100 to stay below two degrees, you would need 25% of the world's energy. So just a quick overview and kind of contrasting these things, likely what we would need to do is a portfolio of all these different technologies, and I haven't even touched on most of them. So very briefly on direct air capture, it's been described as one of the seven chemical separations to change the world because it's very difficult to do you need a huge energy input to process all the air. And this diagram seeks to show what you're trying to do. You need to process all of these balls to find the two red ones. So it's a very wasteful process, essentially. You've got to process all this air to find the two that you're interested in. In terms of the sort of hardcore engineering or chemistry aspects of it, kinetically and thermodynamically, it's a very, very difficult problem. That in simple terms means it needs a lot of energy and it will take a very long time. It will require a lot of materials and it will cost a lot. But because it's likely to be required in one of these sort of portfolio um, scenarios technologies, a lot of, um, sort of professional institutions are calling for research into it. There are companies actually doing this already. I just thought I'd mention two of them very quickly. One is called Carbon Engineering and the other is called Climeworks. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the technology, but in some ways they look quite similar. There's basically a big wall of fans. They pull air through some sort of chemical capture mechanism. And I thought it was quite interesting that this Climework company already, you can pay them to offset your own emissions. So if you want to take a transatlantic flight, for example, you can pay Climeworks to offset those emissions for you by doing direct air capture. Again, the problems with these, the cost, it would cost a lot of money, it requires a lot of energy, it needs a lot of materials. The scale, although these plants are good in a way that you can put them anywhere, so you could put them next to a CO2 storage site, we would need an awful lot of them. The most important point I want to make really is this, it's not a silver bullet technology. We can't 
rely on these technologies working in the future and therefore allow us to do whatever we want now. We need to take climate change seriously and we can't just think, well, forget about it now and we'll use these machines in the future. And finally, the amount of resources it will need. I've talked about the energy demand that will require things like water, materials, et cetera, et cetera. So just to draw things together, I just want to have a few sort of simple conclusions. This talk is not supposed to be against renewable energy. It's not supposed to say we can keep using oil and coal and gas and just rely on direct air capture in the future. It's supposed to say we should really pursue renewable energy technologies because we don't know if these technologies, the direct air capture, et cetera, will work in the future. And we should accelerate the deployment of renewable technology. But at the same time, we can't forget that we're a society that's really dependent on fossil fuels. And the kind of change required to get to 1.5 or 2 degrees global warming is enormous. So for that reason, I would also suggest that we should be capturing carbon dioxide from large stationary sources, such as power plants and cement and steel, etc. This is actually starting to happen in the UK. You'll see in the news in the coming uh, months and years about carbon capture facilities being built in the UK. And then finally, we should be thinking about developing technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the air, because points one and two together won't happen fast enough or at the scale required to get us to below 1.5 or 2 degrees but we also shouldn't just rely on them. And that was the final point I want to make that in the IPCC pathways to less than two degrees, and this is the International Panel on Climate Change, 101 of 116 scenarios that they modeled to keep us below two degrees actually rely on these negative emission technologies that we don't really know work on and we don't really have them yet. So that's why I think quite strongly that we should be developing them, but we shouldn't be relying on them. And that just leaves me to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on LinkedIn. If you want to talk more about these ideas or you're an academic and you'd like to collaborate, you can email me as well. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to taking any questions. Fab, thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, obviously, if you've got any questions, any of the public, uh, then please pop them in the chat. Um, firstly, one that sort of came up for me is obviously you were talking at the start about all of the different uh, renewable energy systems. Um, what type of renewable energy do you personally think is the best? Oh, I don't know if that's a question that's easily answered. Um, I think it depends on things like um, geography, for example. So in the UK, we're, we benefit from the fact that we're an island with a lot of um, water or sea around us so we can put lots of wind turbines out into the sea and kind of not really see them and forget about them. We can use things like tidal energy, for example. Obviously in a landlocked country that will be completely different. Um, so it's not so much that there's a best or a worst, it's more that it will be suited to a certain situation. And I think that's the point I was trying to make about these carbon capture technologies as well, that if you have a portfolio of renewable energy technologies, you're also probably going to have a portfolio of different carbon capture technologies. And mm -hmm. when maybe you see the case be made too strongly for one or the other, I always think it's a little unrealistic and we're, we should be thinking that we needed a lot of these different technologies working together in a sort of quite complex system. Yeah, great, makes sense. Um, so Alex has asked, um, do you have a view on ocean greening where nutrients are pumped into the ocean to encourage algal blooms to capture carbon from the atmosphere? So I'll be completely honest, that's not really a technology or a process that I'm overly familiar with. I have heard of um, ocean um, sort of mineralization approaches, which are kind of similar. I, I guess my overall feeling is that we should be relying on the things that are at the most sort of advanced stage of understanding or technological development and also being really, really aware of unintended consequences in terms of the environment um, and also be thinking very carefully about the economics and the societal impacts of these technologies. And more importantly than that, actually including people in the conversation about those decisions, because events like this are really important. This is where we can have these kinds of conversations. Fantastic. Um, Charlotte has asked, if can't rely on these technologies, that what can we do? Um, so what, in your opinion, is the actual answer to the climate change problem? I think that's a very, very complex question that I've tried to address a little bit. Um, I think my conclusions kind of summarise that we should definitely be prioritising greener, clean energy sources, so wind, um, 
nuclear, solar, etc., that don't involve carbon dioxide emissions. But we should be conscious of the fact that the world is um, an extremely diverse place with lots of different challenges and that one solution in a relatively advanced society or economy like the UK might not be appropriate everywhere. And therefore, we should also be thinking about how do we mitigate the carbon dioxide emissions that in a lot of places are very, very difficult to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, Becky has asked, how quickly would we see a difference in CO2 and rising temperatures if we started capturing it? That's a great question as well. These questions are all very good. Um, <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. So it's something that, I mean, you could do a sort of back of the envelope calculation and start to think about this. It would depend on, um, so let's say you build one direct air capture plant and you start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, you could work out how much carbon dioxide that one plant would capture. And you could work out how much carbon dioxide is all around the world. And then you could start to do those calculations to work out how many you would need. And that's, one of the parts of the problem that's a little bit difficult to communicate because we talk about the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million. That's really, really, really dilute. But it's just because it's spread over such a vast area. Um, even because it's dilute, it doesn't, doesn't mean it doesn't cause a problem for the climate. So it's quite a hard thing to get your head around sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to jump in with a final question, um, just about what do you think your positives, are there any positives that you think you have for us as a society uh, moving forward into the future regarding climate change? Because obviously a lot of this, um, when people think about climate change, it's all very doom and gloom. Um, yeah, any positives that we can maybe draw uh, from? Com completely agree, and I apologise if the tone of my talk was <laughs> not supposed to be that. And I have had those comments before, and I think... Yeah, maybe I need to take that on board. But I think it's important that we all understand, again, the scale and the urgency of this problem. You know, like I said, even the biggest sort of reports and modeling approaches to understand what we can do about these things rely on technologies that we don't have. Um, the scale of action required is massive. So the positive that I would take from that is there are a lot of people working in government, industry and academia thinking about this every single day and coming up with really clever solutions and technologies. Um, it's gonna take a seismic sort of shift in our priorities. And maybe this is the final thought, and it's something that I have to attribute to um, Professor Neelay Shah from Imperial College. He said it in a talk recently, I thought it was really um, sort of insightful. The, the way we think about things at the moment is that we're essentially getting everything very cheap. When we're driving a car and paying for fuel, we're paying less than we actually should. We're relying on people in the future to pay for our mistake now. So maybe that's kind of the way that we should be thinking about it, that there's all these people trying really hard to come up with these solutions, and that's a really good thing. And we should think about doing something now to lower the cost on people in the future. Great, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Yeah, I agree. Some of the, the things that some scientists are coming up with is absolutely fantastic. It's fascinating. Um, yeah, thank you to the audience for all of your questions as well. Um, moving on to the second speaker now, um, we have Giles. So Giles um, works on studying bee disease. Um, and again, if you have any questions for Giles, please pop them in the comments box and we'll go through them at the end of Giles' talk. So give me a little nod when I'm live. Yeah, I'm up, right, okay. Great, so um, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Giles, I work up at Newcastle University as well, and I'm part of the Modeling Evidence and Policy Group, which is a research group that tries to bring together all aspects of evidence and try to formulate them, work out what's going on in complex biological systems, and then try and help inform policy. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about emerging viral diseases in bees. So let me just go back to here. So quick summary of the talk, I'm going to break it down into threes, going to just have a few minutes thinking about, well, why should we care about bees? Why is it important to think about them and their welfare? Think a little bit about some of the pressures, you know, um, Greg's already mentioned some of those. And actually, we, we might find that, that they pop up again in my talk about some of the pressures on, on our pollinators. And then I'm going to talk about really my area of expertise, uh, which is thinking about viral diseases and in particular viral diseases in the honeybee. <clears throat> 
So let's have a think about why should we care about bees? Well, the main reason to care about bees is that they're fantastic pollinators. They're, they're actually out there, out and going out and about and trying to effectively um, help these angiosperms, these flowering plants, to complete their sexual reproductive cycle. They're moving pollen, these male seminal cells, from the anther over across to the female parts of the flower and allowing them to pollinate. Okay. Lots of different ways that flowers go about needing to be pollinated. Those of you that are gardeners will be well aware of the fact that sometimes you have a single flower like I have in my image here. And in that single flower, you'll have both the male and the female parts of the flower. Other plants operate in a different way. They have a male and a female uh, flower on the same plant. And then others like willow are dioecious and they have a male and female flower on different plants. OK, so what these uh, bees are fantastic at is moving pollen from flower to flower and, and helping to achieve pollination. Why that's important is because if we look at all of the different angiosperms across different um, places around the world, different regions around the world, what we start to realise is that those plant communities are heavily reliant on the presence of animal pollination. So you can see here, this is some uh, data from Jeff Ollerton from a paper of his back in 2011, and you can see that top right hand dot is showing us that around 90% of, of, of these plants require animal pollination in some form or, or another. And if we try to bring that home a little bit and think about benefits to humans, actually, if we look at all of the crops, all the plants that we grow for human consumption across the world, around 90 of them out of 125 require insect pollination in some way, shape or form. And that gives a massive contribution to global, global GDP. So it's worth it. If you just want to think about just the hard nose commercial reality of it, it's worth thinking about bee health in the round. But there are all sorts of pollinators that we have in the UK. And um, I would say that probably 2,000 species is a bit of an underestimate. There's all sorts of things like bees and some wasps, butterflies, moths, hoverflies, also flies and beetles, all sorts of things that are going about their business, collecting their protein from the pollen of the flowers and, 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 and moving around that pollen to the female parts. And providing pollination service provision. Most of these are wild pollinators. Uh, they're not directly managed by humans. There are two on here which you could say are managed pollinators. The one at the top is Bombus terrestris, and, and that could be um, seen as a commercial pollinator. It's managed from the point of view that the colonies, you can buy them online and you can move them into your glass house to help encourage pollination very good at buzz pollination. And then the bottom here, you can see the honeybee. There's only one species of honeybee in this country. There's all these other thousands of pollinators in this country. There's only one honeybee. It's a very numerous honey uh, species, uh, mainly managed though, not wild, and managed by beekeepers. And we've probably got a few beekeepers maybe on the, uh, on the talk today. So when we think about the pressures, we've got to think about whether or not these organisms are managed or whether or not they are, are wild. And also we need to understand a little bit more about their biology. This just tries to distill all of the complex interactions that are out there that might be um, driving um, down pollinator populations. And this is from a, a paper that we published with uh, Adam van Bergen a few years ago. And if you go from the top left, one of the real drivers is land use. Our, the way that we manage our land is um, not conducive to having a, a healthy and thriving pollinator population. It's, it's highly fragmented. We use a lot of uh, pesticides. And also, we don't really think about providing biodiversity in, in, in form of flora for those, those pollinators. Climate change, we've already talked about that in the previous talk, a really good introduction to what the problems are. But as those temperatures rise, or as, as perhaps the weather patterns become more fragmented and changeable, you do get this sort of um, mismatch between the availability of the pollinators and the availability of the flowers. That's called a sort of phenological mismatch. They can shift at different rates as temperatures change. And that means that the food and the pollination service become um, detached. Invasive species is on here is an important factor because they can disrupt um, plant pollinator networks. But we've also got pests and diseases on here. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, um, how they can affect pollinator um, numbers and, and force pressure on pollinator populations. <laughs> 
Let's just have a, a, a look at some data from a paper by Caravo et al. in 2016. And this is showing you, if you like, the proboscis length. And it's just to give you an idea that these pressures will operate at different, in different ways and at different scales for different individual species. What this is showing is the length of the feeding tubes or the feeding mouth parts of these different individual insect species, each dot is an insect species, and you can see as you go down those different family groups of the different bee species, you can see how some of them have got very short proboscis length and others have got much longer. How does that affect them? Well, it depends what happens to their food sources, because if you lose all the flowers with the very long trumpets, which require these extra long mouth parts in order to access the nectar, that's going to impact some species more than others. Okay, so actually it's just a way of looking at, at this information and saying that depending on what we do with the landscape will depend on how we individually impact some of these different species. The second point I wanted to make um, was actually that, that honeybees are managed, which means that they don't have to worry about the habitat when it comes to finding nest sites. That's not the same for a lot of wild bees. They have to find a nest site first and build from that nest site using the floral resources that are available. Here you can see our, one, of our, one of our apiaries up on a roof um, of one of our buildings at Newcastle University. Well, we provided that to the honeybee and that's something that honeybee as a managed pollinator doesn't have to worry about. So with a little bit of background then, we've thought about some of the pressures, we've been introduced to the pollinators and why they're important. Let's go down and zoom in to look at a viral disease. Um, some people might be surprised that bees, honeybees have pathogens and parasites at all. So I thought it'd be just good to run through a few examples. And just to say that, yes, they do. They have lots of great examples of things that live on them or live off them and cause um, impact to their health. First of all, you've got this ectoparasitic mite. This is called a varroa mite. Uh, that sucks the blood and some of the fatty tissue out of the bees. Uh, and it passes on viruses, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, a bit smaller, we're going to get smaller in scale. We've got trypanosomes here on the right and in the middle we've got microsporidia, these Nesema species. Both of these can cause severe disease in honeybees. They've got bacterial pathogens that cause bacterial disease. You've got the one on the left here, which has just turned probably a pupa into mush, a bacterial soup, and that's called American fowl brood. I've also given you a nice healthy image of a honeybee um, larva there. And below it, a second bacterial disease, European fowl brood, again, causing um, all sorts of problems in honeybee colonies. And then we've got the viruses. We're going down to the smallest scale now. We've got lots of different viruses. Most of them look pretty boring, like the, one, the ones uh, in the center here, these icosahedral, almost circular structures, really quite tiny. Um, and then some are a bit more interesting. And we're going to talk about the one that's a little bit more interesting on the right hand side. So, so bees have an awful lot of different pathogens and parasites, and, and as a result, suffer a range of different diseases. And sometimes that's surprising to people. Why is that? Well, actually, one of the reasons is that honeybees are a bit of a dream host. You know, if, if, if we think about how they live, uh, on the left here with the bees up the side, you can see one pile of boxes. That's one hive, that's one colony, and that one colony is headed up by a single queen. Okay, She's the only reproductive female in the colony. She may well have mated with sort of between 9 and 15 males, which gives them some genetic diversity, but actually the vast number of individuals in there are going to be really quite similar um, genetic stocks. Okay, so if one of them is able, if a, if a pathogen is able to cause disease in one of them, it's probably able to cause disease in many of them. If we look in one of those boxes from above, we see lots of different frames, and each one of those frames, if we take them out, we've got thousands of individuals in there, often at very similar life stages, all packed in next to each other. And if there's one thing we've learned about things like viral disease, they they the one that we've been trying to cope with in the human population recently, how have we managed it? Well, we manage it by distancing ourselves, don't we? We try and stay away from others that might have it, and that will reduce the reproductive ratio, the R value. Actually, with honeybees, you can't really do that. They're living in these really tightly packed communities, and in a stack of boxes like that on the left, you've probably got up to 60,000 bees living next to each other. So they can't, they can't operate at that level. So when something gets in, it can often spread very rapidly within the colony and cause problems.
So which one shall I choose? I mean, we've got all sorts of diseases we can talk about, but the one I'm going to talk to you about today is chronic bee paralysis. And it's kind of an old adage to, to talk about how old and ancient this disease is. Many of the diseases associated with honeybees have um, a long history. This one is probably one of the longest. It's documented in the literature for over 2000 years, first by Aristotle, who described the symptoms I'm about to show you really very well. We're dealing here with a virus, which is an RNA virus, just like um, SARS-2 is, the one that we're struggling with, COVID-19. Um, it's got an RNA genome uh, and it's bipartite, which, which is more similar to in influenza, actually influenza virus. Okay, it's got two, its genome is split into two sections. Let's have a look at some symptoms. Um, if you've never looked in a honeybee colony, the bees tend to run around and move forwards. What they don't tend to do, and I hope you can see this, is they don't tend to do these repeated forward and backward movements um, with the, the flickering, the shimmering of the wings. All of that is really unusual. And that's the effect of the virus actually invading the neural tissues of these bees and causing a form of paralysis. Okay, hence the name chronic bee paralysis so hopefully you could you could see that for the beekeepers that might be on the call individual bees can show different symptoms the one on the left here um, is is looks very much like an old worker but in fact it's been nibbled it's been attacked part of the immune the immunity of the colony is a series of behaviors uh, one of the behaviors is to try and get individuals that are sick out and they do that by nibbling at them and trying to get rid of them and you can see those nibbled wings there on the right you can see a greasy looking bee both of these could actually be symptoms of chronic bee paralysis as well why is it important it's important because these bees do not recover if they're showing symptoms then they've got a few days left before they will die and sometimes because of the way that the virus spreads they can die they go from nothing to dying in their thousands you can see them at the front here this colony is it likely to survive about 40 percent of colonies that show these sorts of symptoms fail and the other 60 percent don't provide honey that year so it can be very serious a very serious disease what we're interested in is, is chronic bee paralysis an emerging viral disease in England and Wales? And I wanted to share some of our work up at Newcastle University um, about that. OK, first of all, we start to look at the light now. You know, we're doing two very dark talks in one evening. Do we? We can't cope with that without actual real beer in a pub. Um, and, and this is a good news story. We've got a really good team of inspectors, bee health inspectors in the UK. The UK has one of the best bee health inspection services in the world. And they go about looking for various different ailments and trying to control them on behalf of the beekeepers of, of England and Wales. And what we did is we took some information that they'd stored in, in a, a database called BeeBase, and we looked at all of those visits and we tried to um, find any signal in there for this, uh, this uh, disease, chronic bee paralysis, as an emerging disease. Where did we look? Well, we looked in the areas of the of the beekeeper notes where they write down various different bits of information about the colony that they're looking at. And we were looking for word searches, really, paralysis, trembling, shivering and shaking, to see whether or not we could then suggest that perhaps there was good evidence that there was this particular disease present. What did we find when we looked at these results? Well, we found something that was really interesting, actually. In 2006, which was the first year we looked at these data, we didn't find any examples of this particular disease. But from 2007 onwards, we started to see what's effectively um, an increase year on year, exponential increase, all the way through to um, 2017. So we suddenly saw a takeoff of this emerging disease right at the start of, of when it was coming into uh, the honeybee population and you can see it here in these images you can see where we go from the top left 2007 just just a few cases in one county in england and as we go across and then we go down and across again we start to see the intensity and the frequency and the distribution of these cases increasing over time and by the time we finish we've got cases in all but just a few counties from across england and wales so really good clear evidence that we have an emerging viral disease in honeybees sorts of things that we do uh, in our group is we effectively think about sort of um, the epidemiology of a disease and we start looking for risk factors when you've got an emerging problem you've got to try to work out what what are the risks associated with um, with with having the disease and some of the things that we found out 
pretty early on were that, that professional apiaries or those owned by professional beekeepers, those with more than 40 colonies, had a greater risk of the disease. And also importers, those that import honeybee queens from abroad also had a tendency to have an increased risk. And this kind of information is kind of, um, it's sort of the lifeblood really to starting to investigate why this disease is increasing and why it's becoming more of a problem in recent years. So suffice to say, we've just started on this journey. We've only recently realized really in the last 18 months, two years, that this is a problem. And we've actually been uh, commissioned from BBSRC to, um, to, to run a project both with Newcastle University and also St Andrews, as well as with the Bee Farmers Association and the APHA National Bee Unit to really start to look at this problem and take it apart. And we'll share those, um, the, those data with you as they come to light over the next few years. So hopefully that gives you a bit of background into um, some of the pressures on pollinators, but also this emerging viral disease in honeybees. They do have diseases too, um, and you can study them and you can find out more about them. And hopefully we can mitigate their effects as we go into the future. All right, thanks for your attention. Happy to take questions. These are my contact details should you require them. Let's have a look. Great, again, another really interesting talk, thank you. Um, again, to everyone watching, if you've got any questions, please post them below. Um, just to begin with this one that I just read that, yeah, I kind of thought myself, um, how does the disease actually spread? Um, so do you get bees that kind of go into other people's, or other bees' colonies, or is it, you know, spread when they're out pollinating? Do they spread it via the flowers? Yes, yeah, so it's a good question, and, and quite often when you've got a viral disease, they tend to they tend to have a bent for actually spreading in one particular way or another. But with this particular virus, it's able to spread in lots of different ways. We think it can spread by effectively when a bee dies in a colony and they have to move around that dead body. It can spread from the dead body to the live bee. Um, it can spread um, in effectively um, orally, so a bee being fed some virus. Okay, um, it can be spread by injecting it. It can be spread by by bees rubbing up against each other. So there's lots of different mechanical transmission that's called. There's loads of different transmission processes actually with this particular virus, which makes it very interesting um, to mm -hmm. try to take apart um, and find out more about how it moves. Um, so Newcastle District beekeepers um, have asked, are any treatments feasible? That's a good question. And obviously, um, when you go into this kind of research project, the idea is to find out what new management methods to help mitigate the problem. And um, we're not there yet. There are various different, uh, I guess, um, uh, treatment methods that have been that have been suggested. The old adage is replace the queen. I've never seen any good evidence for that ever. OK, so uh, everyone says, oh, just replace the queen and it's fine. Never seen any good evidence for that one. Another one from a bee farmer a few years ago was to effectively carry out what if it's a beekeeper asking the question. Um, I'll give them a beekeeper's answer, which is a, a, a sort of a, a mobile shook swarm where you, you move the bees away from their original position and you shake them into the grass effectively um, or preferably into the air with this one. And you allow those uh, healthy bees to fly back. And those sick bees aren't able to fly back because of the partial paralysis that I was trying to show you in those symptoms. And they've suggested that they do actually get some benefit from that treatment, although I've heard as many beekeepers suggest that hasn't worked as have. But it's something okay. we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, someone else who um, obviously loves bees. So Lindsay has said, what are the best things that I can do to take care of the bees that are around my garden? So can I help protect them from these parasites and pathogens? That's a good question. So one of the best ways, if you're talking about honeybees, and remember we talked about wild bees being the majority of the species, but if you're talking about honeybees, the one best thing I would suggest anybody could do is not put their empty jars of honey out for the bees to, to clear up. There's a lot of people think that that's the right thing to do. There's a bit of honey left in there. The bees will come over to it very, very quickly. Unfortunately, most of the um, honey that we have in this country comes from abroad. More than 90, 90, 95% of it is imported. And it's imported from countries which have much worse bee health than we do. And a lot of these pathogens and parasites and things can survive in the honey and they will be passed on to that colony. And actually, 
the one I showed earlier, the bacterial one, um, American foul breed, it's a brilliant way of actually spreading American foul breed around an area to actually allow the bees access to imported honey. So that's the first thing. More generally, for bee health, it's all about making sure that they've got the right amount of food. OK, so if you're thinking about wild bees more generally, you're looking at trying to give plenty of different flowers available to them. Really, I always think biodiversity is the key. The more biodiverse your garden, the better it will be for all sorts of insects, whether that be bees or whether it be butterflies or moths or whatever. OK. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Alex has asked, uh, she read a book, so titled The History of Bees, um, which talked about colony collapse. She wrote about humans manually pollinating crops. Do you think that this could be needed in the future if bee populations decline? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because, we, you know, it, sometimes you think about this being a, a dystopic future. We've already done this in some parts of the world. In, in some parts of China, their insect population was decimated, but they actually had a very high fruit production um, required in that area. All the trees were planted, so they used humans to go around and pollinate the crops. OK, um, so it has been done previously. Uh, I, I don't think it will get there, actually. I think there's a, a better awareness of what pollinators' needs are now than there ever has been. Um, and I think there are more and more people like myself and in other universities and in other governments that have that awareness. The public opinion and the public pressure that's put on governments to change policies has really been evident in recent years when it comes to thinking about um, uh, policy changes like the neonicotinoid use um, and those kinds of pesticides which, which started to really evidence started to come out that they weren't good for bees and other and other pollinators so i'm hoping we won't get there although some parts of the world already have been there but then god come back from the brink and now they do have insects that will pollinate those crops so i think maybe the my my insane optimism because i'm also a beekeeper and you have to be an insane optimist to be a beekeeper uh, it says that perhaps the worst days have gone maybe fantastic it's a nice little sort of towards the end have something a bit more at beat um, Steve has asked, can bees catch and spread human disease, uh, spread diseases to human, um, hoping that there's no bee COVID? Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't want any more sort of bat type things. Now, bees are quite distantly related to humans. And, and so um, none of the viruses that they have are known to replicate in humans. There is a really interesting paper out there where some humans caught um, effectively an, a bee disease. And this is how they did it. OK, so they were intravenous drug users. And instead of uh, boiling up their heroin with sugar, they decided that they would boil up their heroin with honey. Now, there's one pathogen in there. And I already mentioned it, it's penicillus larva which causes American foul breed and if I want to isolate that in a lab I'll boil up some honey and it's the only thing that can survive and anyway these these guys ended up with all sorts of problems organ failure and all sorts of things and when they finally isolated it from their blood they realized it was a bee pathogen that's the only one I know of <laughs> so. okay just uh yeah <laughs> point of science does not condone um cooking up heroin mm. um what are your suggestions to someone wanting to get into beekeeping? Is it as hard as it looks? Do you know, um, the best way to get into beekeeping is to very much find out whether you like it before you go and buy bees. You have to educate yourself before you get a colony. And it's not just reading a book. It's also the practical education. It's an incredibly practical hobby. OK, and the best way to do it is to find a mentor, find somebody who's done it before, who's good at it and, and, and let them help you along. The worst thing to do is buy bees and expect to keep them alive. You wouldn't go out and buy, um, you know, a flock of sheep, would you? And expect to know how to look after them. Well, in many ways, honeybees can be seen as livestock. And so we have to take their health very seriously. And to do that, put yourself in a safe pair of hands, somebody who's experienced. Someone has just popped here up here saying join a beekeeping association. Is another thing um, you can do. <laughs> how how much sort of work slash effort is it to actually keep bees? Do you have to go out and do things daily? Is it weekly? What uh, kind yeah, of so things are actually, you know, what, what do you need to do? Okay, so um, the sorts of things that you do depend on the time of year. So the beekeeping season starts in the autumn when you're trying to make sure that your bees are nice and strong and healthy going into winter and they've got plenty of food. Um, through the winter, you're probably only going to your bees every month, I would say. You don't really want to disturb them. You're just keeping an eye on them, making sure they haven't blown over, making sure they're not too light and they've eaten too much food, uh, making sure a mouse hasn't got in and chewed a load of, um, of, of the, the frames, those kinds of things. As you reach this time of year, so, so I'd, I'd say... 
April, May, June, July, that's the really busy time for a beekeeper because you've got to be there every week. You're doing swarm checks, you're making sure they're okay, you're checking the levels of some of these pests and, and parasites that I've just been talking about. Um, and that, that's a little bit more intensive. So you kind of got the summer where it's a weekly thing, I would say, and I would say the winter where it's very much a monthly thing. Yeah, that kind of amount of time. But an hour or two depends how good you are and how many colonies you've got. Fascinating, thank you. Um, not sure if we've got any more questions coming through. Just having a... Oh, so Alex has asked. Um, she's not sure how true this is. Uh, she listened to a nature podcast where they talked about bees releasing RNA into their royal jelly as vaccines. Do you know what evidence there is of this? Yes, yeah, so this is this is the concept of transgenerational immune priming, okay, which is quite a complicated way of saying um, the way that we try to control viruses, we do it and bees do it too, is um, is that we try to identify the replicative form of a virus and then our body recognises that it's the replicative form and it starts to chop it up and each time it chops up one of the viral copies of the RNA, um, then effectively it creates a cascade which gets more and more choppy uppy and then it controls the actual replication of the virus and there is some evidence to suggest that in 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 honeybees um, that they pass on some of those signals uh, through their royal jelly and into the next generation which is why it's called transgenerational immune priming okay is it how, how necessary would that really be considering you know you, you mentioned earlier that we're so unlikely to actually get any um any viruses that bees actually have anyway so that doesn't necessarily protect us anyway Oh, I see. Was that was the question to say that by eating royal jelly, then you would be protected against virus? Because I thought it was the the, the no, the maybe young, the young the, the the young bees would be protected against something that the old bees had encountered. That's the way I read it. Ah, okay. I I read it as we would be protected. <laughs> no, very much no, didn't make much no. sense to me. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, in that case, there's absolutely no evidence yeah. that eating <laughs> okay. royal jelly will protect you from COVID nineteen. <laughs> um, right, I think that was the last question from us. Um, as I say again, thank you very much um, for your very interesting talk. Um, and thank you to everyone um, that asked the question, everyone that's watched. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Um, there are plenty more tomorrow um, that if you have a look online, um, you'll be able to find the schedule for all the different talks that are tomorrow. Um, and there'll be another two fascinating talks uh, that you can get involved with. Thank you.